Star Wars is officially back. That's right, for the first time since Kenobi in June, we are getting weekly content with Andor. Disney dropped the first three episodes with more on the way over the next nine weeks. Each week we'll be here to give you our thoughts and reactions, as well as pointing out some cool tidbits you may have missed. With it being a three episodic premiere, we have plenty to go over today. First, we'll get into some general thoughts and first impressions, then we'll deep dive into each episode in a more spoiler-heavy manner and wrap it up with some easter eggs. Let's get going, Red Squadron! I've made it very public in the early days of this channel that I was really looking forward to this series. We're getting a more grounded and fleshed out story centered around one of the main characters in Rogue One, easily my favorite movie since Disney purchased the rights to Star Wars. Cassian Andor doesn't come with the nostalgia baggage of a Boba Fett or Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's going to be so refreshing scrolling on Star Wars Twitter and not wanting to rip my eyes out after an episode. A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Anyways, if you told me that Andor wasn't a part of the Star Wars universe, I'd honestly believe you. Aside from Cassian Andor and a couple of mentions of the Empire and Republic, this show could pass as a sci-fi spy show from a completely different universe. It feels different from any Star Wars we've ever seen before, and I like that. The earlier reviews you may have seen online were not wrong. Andor is gritty, grounded, down to earth, and much more mature. The two season format with 12 episodes each is going to allow it to be much more character driven than what we've been given recently. The acting was stellar, Diego Luna really knocked it out of the park once again. Other standouts were undoubtedly Adria Arjona, Stellan Skarsgård, and probably my favorite so far, Kyle Soler. Most of what was shown in the trailers and TV spots leading up to the premiere was present in these first three episodes. However, there is still a lot we haven't seen yet. Mon Mothma, Saw Gerrera, those Phase 2 clones, or any of the larger Empire for that matter. This show is not going to be an Easter egg or cameo fest like The Mandalorian or The Book of Boba Fett. It's clear that this will be a much more self-contained story. Sure, director Krennic is probably a safe bet. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a Bail Organa, Galen Erso, or even Grand Moff Tarkin but I really don't think we're getting a Darth Vader. Hell, I'd be surprised if we even see a lightsaber, and honestly, that's a good thing. This show is going to do wonders for world building and showing the rough and gritty early days of the Rebellion before they were blowing up Death Stars. It's new, it's fresh, and it's something I've wanted Disney to do with the IP for years. Anyways, I think it's time to dive into each of these episodes. Spoilers are ahead, you've been warned. Diving into episode one, we start on the planet of Morlano One, a brand new world to the Star Wars galaxy. It's five years before the Battle of Yavin and the events of Rogue One and A New Hope. We know the series will take place over those entire five years. The first season will reportedly be over the span of one year, with the second season taking place over the four before Rogue One. We see Cassian Andor walking through a rainy street. His hood is up to keep a low profile and probably honestly to keep himself dry. He heads into a brothel in search of his sister, who we have not met before. One of the women who work at the establishment tells Cassian, a woman from Canari, which we learn is his home world, this will play into the story later on, used to work there. Then a couple of drunken goons start giving Cassian a hard time. The goons turn out to be pretty low-level Imperial Sentry officers, like really low-level. There doesn't even seem to be a stormtrooper or anything close to that present on the planet. They harass Cassian outside and in a tussle he accidentally kills one before shooting the other on purpose. Certainly not a far cry from the Andor we see at the beginning of Rogue One when he shoots one of his rebel allies. Cassian then flees the planet and heads to Ferrix, where he'll spend the remainder of these first few episodes. We meet Cassian's OG droid buddy before he gets K2SO, this adorable little shop vac looking cube called B2EMO that is often just referred to as B. Then we get our first of many flashback scenes which we're probably getting a ton of throughout the series, given Cassian's throwaway line in Rogue One. However, Cassian does look much older than six years old. I'd put him at at least 10. Over the three episodes, we get several of these scenes. We see Cassian on his home planet of Canari, which features a massive mining facility. He seems to be a part of a more primitive village of kids, almost like a Lord of the Flies vibe going on here. None of the characters speak English, and there are no subtitles, meaning we can only infer what they're saying. Young Cassian interacts with a girl, who we must assume is his sister. She refers to Cassian as Cassa. Maybe this is his actual birth name. They look to the sky to see a ship crash land off in the distance, which turns out to be a Republic ship that has left a lot of fans confused. We'll get into that when we talk Easter eggs later on. But a Republic officer kills one of Cassian's fellow villagers before they deal with him via a few blow darts. Cassian then heads into the ship alone to explore and gets freaked out by his own reflection. He's found by a pair of characters that we can assume are scrappers. 
they subdue Cassian and flee, since the Republic is reportedly on their way. To be clear, that's all spaced out over those three episodes, it just kind of made sense to get that all out of the way at once. Back to the present time. We meet Kyle Soler's character, Cyril Karn. I would describe him as the Dwight Schrute of the Empire. Dude really buys into the propaganda and will clearly do whatever he can to climb the ranks of the already 15 year old regime. His superior officer tells him not to pursue the case of who killed the officers, but he obviously does anyways. Cassian goes to one of his allies, Bix Kaleen, who almost comes off like an ex-girlfriend, and tells her he has a piece of Imperial equipment, a NS9 Starpath unit. Upon further research, this is a navigation instrument used to see Imperial spaceships within a range of 9 parsecs. Pretty useful. Cassian wants to sell the item, and fast, so he can lose any potential heat with the Empire. We also meet Bix's partner Tim, who's definitely not too fond of Cassian, and has no idea his girlfriend smuggles goods off-world. Cassian continues on with trying to cover his tracks, running into someone he owes money to, and unsuccessfully trying to secure a ship. This pretty much brings us into episode 2 territory, which was less eventful than the first, but still pretty solid. We meet Cassian's adoptive mother, and find out that a warrant has been placed for his arrest, specifically for a canary born male who lives on Ferrix. From this we learn that his actual home world being Kanari is a close kept secret that few are aware of, even his identification says he was born on Fest. Cassian meets up with Bix again, who says the buyer will be there in the morning, he is however now apprehensive given the warrant. Tim observes them from afar, and decides to report Cassian to the Empire. The Empire is stumped by his home world coming up as Fest, but after getting an image and confirming with the woman from the brothel, they prepare to mobilize for much of the episode. Andor's buyer, who is revealed to be Luthan Rail, arrives on Ferrix, now getting into episode 3 and probably the strongest so far, at least in my opinion. The Imperial officers show up and begin to search for Cassian on Ferrix, they head to his mother's and tear the place apart, even interrogating B right as Cassian tries to contact him. Cassian meets Luthan at an abandoned warehouse of some sort, and they begin negotiating. Cassian explains how he stole the device, saying the secret is just to walk in like you own the place. That the Empire has become so fat and satisfied, that they don't think someone would be bold enough to even try something like that. As the talks continue, Luthan admits to knowing a lot more about Cassian than he realized, even knowing how his father was hung. Cassian doesn't like this, tensions rise and he gets the sense Luthan might be an Imperial spy and draws a blaster on him. Before things escalate any further between the two, the officers arrive at the building, a shootout erupts, with some really cool set pieces that were hanging from the ceiling coming into play, Luthan sets off some charges that he had set up prior to the meeting, and they escape through a tunnel, however the Starpath unit was lost in the mayhem. After a further shootout, Cassian and Luthan rig a speeder up as a bomb, and make it to Luthan's ship to head off world. Cyril is left to watch a group of his officers die, and I think his character is headed in one of two directions. Either he's conflicted and may end up on Cassian's side before long, or he's going to double down in his efforts and continue to lead the opposition. He'll probably get some backlash from his superior officer too, since you know he kind of disobeyed orders. Either way, he was definitely the standout actor. Now let's get into a few of the easter eggs we picked up on. First of all, those Republic officers from the flashback scene are really confusing. The characters refer to them as Republic, but the patch on their uniforms is a separatist insignia, and their ship's interior looks almost imperial. Not sure what exactly is going on there, could be a continuity error. The blaster that Cassian uses in the shootout with Cyril's men, and when he stands off with Luthan, is the same blaster as Kyle Katarn's from the Jedi Knight video games. In the Ferrix shipyard, you can spot what looks to be a rebel Y-Wing. On the subject of ships, those gunships that Cyril's men use look almost like a toned down version of a Republic gunship. We knew they'd be coming, thanks to a Lego set dropped in August. One of the officers are seen eating blue noodles, I'm pretty sure you can actually get these at Galaxy's Edge, can't confirm though because I've tragically never been there. Tim mentions Wobani in a quick throwaway line, that's a planet featured in Rogue One when Jin Erso is captured by the Empire. The planet's name is actually a play on Obi-Wan Kenobi's. Oh, it's beautiful. But those were the few we picked up on, if we missed any out, do let us know in the comments below. I imagine we'll get plenty more in the episodes involving the Senate and higher up Imperial officers. Overall, Andor got off to a very fun start, and we were not left disappointed. Sure, the episodes may have moved a little bit slowly, but I think Disney struck gold. But what did you think of the first three episodes? Let us know, and while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe. 
We'll be back with reactions and breakdowns for episode 4 next week, and every week after that. Until then, Red 5 standing by.